So, a little over a day ago, the New York Knicks and Minnesota Timberwolves, as well as the Charlotte Hornets, made a deal that was pretty perplexing to most people, not one that most anticipated, moving Julius Randle and Dante DiVincenzo to Minnesota and Carl Anthony Towns to New York. Now, what I think is most interesting about this deal is that we're talking about what was essentially the black sheep for both of these teams, the star player that there is a lot of discussion of does this guy actually belong here? The irony being that these are kind of the guys who got the ball rolling for their team getting to where it did, like Julius Randle with the Knicks. First season wasn't great, but second season he was all NBA, and I believe he got eighth in MVP voting. And Carl Anthony Towns was the number one pick of the Timberwolves in 2015, started finally building up hype from there. They did have Andrew Wiggins to be hyped about at the time as well, but Cat kind of became the guy for the franchise, but Brunson circumvented Julius and was just clearly a better player, and Anthony Edwards did the same exact thing for Cat. And now, both of these teams are trying to see, does the black sheep of our franchise fit better elsewhere? I talked about the details of this trade initially with my initial reaction, and I'm going to be repeating a couple of the points that I made in that video, so apologies for that, but the more and more I reflected on it, I was already high on the Carl Anthony Towns to New York aspect of it, New York side of this trade. The more I've sat on it, the more I've thought about it, I'm even higher on them than I was before. As far as the Eastern Conference stands, I think they have a pretty good shot of beating Boston, more so than they did before, that's for sure. So I wanna talk about the Knicks, why I feel good about them, as well as some of the negative aspects of the trade that I actually managed to avoid discussing in my initial reaction because I wasn't really factoring it in. Let's talk about Cat to New York and why I'm high on the Knicks this year. Hello everybody, welcome to Asa Rusty Buckets. If you are over on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and drop a like. It helps the video do better in the algorithm, so it's much appreciated. Also check us out over on Apple Podcasts and Spotify if you wanna enjoy this as an audio only experience. Also, just one quick thing, yesterday, there was a video uploaded on this channel that was accidentally the raw file of the original recording rather than the edited version that is going to be going up Wednesday now because of course we have hot takes Tuesdays but yeah apologies for that especially for those of you who had to see me just sit there and blankly stare uh into the camera as I was getting ready to record because it's one of the worst things I hate I hate it so much and all of you got to see it a few like like 800 people Whatever. With that said, let's get to the Knicks. So first thing I wanna talk about is a big area of concern that I did not address on my initial reaction, and that was the bench unit situation for the Knicks. So Dante DiVincenzo was probably a shoe in to be a very high candidate in the six man of the year race. A lot of the discussion has also been about the Nova Knicks aspect. The fact that Dante was a part of the Villanova squad that featured Mikhail, Josh Hart, and Jalen Brunson. And that was a big narrative. I'm not a college basketball guy, so I really didn't give a shit about this aspect of things. But you know, there was a whole thing about like the power of friendship, Jalen Brunson passing up a hundred million dollars just so this squad can be together. So a lot of people felt the way about Dante DiVincenzo no longer being on the team, especially because Dante was one of the most exciting aspects of this team last year. He shot 40% from three on like nine attempts per game, had a 25 game stretch to close the season where he was averaging 20 points per game and going to be a great, 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 great six man for this team. I do think there was a chance that he was going to start and Josh Hart would have been the six man, but especially if Julius Randle is there, you need at least two forward spots out there and when you do it, you would need one for Julius and then you're gonna have to slot one over to the shooting guard because Mikhail and OG also need to start. So Dante was kind of the odd man out and a lot of the reports after the fact is that he really wasn't as thrilled about the idea of the Nova Knicks as the other three guys were. I think that stems from the fact that he had a breakout year and he was gonna go from starter and a key, key, key part of the offense to six man. And no matter how good or prolific he could have been in that six man role, ultimately it is a reduced role. Ultimately, ultimately it means he probably won't be closing games for them unless he's just on fire and they feel like keeping him in situationally. So it made sense that he didn't really wanna be there anymore. 
and I think a lot of people are underpinning that aspect of this deal when they discuss it. Another thing that I just completely blanked on was the financial aspect of it for Minnesota, but we are here to talk about the Knicks. So the bench is the biggest concern right now because you really only have two players coming off of your bench that I would describe as guys that you are comfortable, even a little bit beyond comfortable being in your playoff rotation. Those players being Miles McBride or Deuce McBride as most people call him and Mitchell Robinson. Mitchell Robinson was already coming off of the bench for this team, so that's not new and Miles was too, but in the case of Miles, he's probably going to have a bigger role than he originally was. He's probably going to be looked at to try and replace some of the offensive ability that Dante DiVincenzo displayed last year. And those are some pretty big shoes to fill because that was a rather large leap in his production from other stages of his career. But I also think Miles has gotten better every single year of his career. He's a pretty damn strong defender and a pretty damn strong three-point shooter. During the regular season last year, Year, in 20 minutes a game he shot 41 percent from three on four attempts and in the playoffs over 13 games he got up to be a 27 minute per game guy and he shot 37 percent from three on five attempts so i think that he'll be a good bench piece and mitchell can be a good bench piece now how much you can actually play mitchell that depends. How much are they going to do the Carl Anthony Towns at the four with Mitchell at the five thing, kind of replicate the same thing they did with Rudy Gobert over in Minnesota alongside Cat. But he's probably not gonna be able to play more than like 20-ish minutes a night because backup center is the backup position that you can get the least amount of minutes at because you can put a small forward at the two or the four. You can't really put a five at the four unless we're talking about Cat and the same thing does not apply to Mitchell. So I don't know how much they'll go with those double big lineups. That will be interesting to see. I would not doubt that Tom Thibodeau would be interested in trying that given that his main focus is always the defensive end of the floor. And I think you'll probably end up having an overall better defense with Mitchell on the floor. He's probably not going to be able to play more than like 20 minutes a game. That would be my guess when we're talking about the playoff rotation. So you have to do something to bolster this bench because there's really not anybody else here that you're all too thrilled about. Precious Achua can maybe play. It's not like a nightmare situation. Chuma Okeke actually just signed with them and he is uh, not good. Oh my God. He had a decent rookie year. I actually haven't checked in on him for a little bit because my friend uh, Xavier is a Magic fan and he uh, was high on Chuma after his rookie year, but no, he's he's bad. He's a career 38% from the field and 32% from three, so it's not gonna come from him more likely than not. I hate Cameron Payne. I don't think he's good. I think he had a moment with the Phoenix Suns and now everyone's pretending that that moment was like some prolonged change. It's not, not a good player. The other one, Precious Achua. Precious actually did end up playing a relatively significant minutes for a decent stretch of the playoffs last year. Played nine games, played 20 minutes a game in that action, played a little bit of the four and a little bit of the five. Unfortunately, his three ball was not a factor whatsoever and offensively he doesn't really have a lot to contribute beyond that other than just being a big man who can make a layup here or there decent defensive versatility defense in general is pretty good but i don't really think he's someone that you want to play a lot either now as far as this team you have to factor in that we're talking about a tom thibodeau coach team here and in terms of a playoff rotation that can be cut rather short. Tibbs is not exactly somebody who's going to be going 9-10 deep in a playoff setting. However, the fact that you only have two bench pieces means that you can only go seven deep. And after that, you're probably going to have to play somebody that you do not feel good about playing. The other, maybe Marcus Morris has something to give you, but I wouldn't really bank on that. Maybe Landry Shamit has something to give you as a three-point shooter, but also that's not something I'm really willing to bet on. So somewhere along the line, the Knicks do need to add an eighth man, like probably a forward. Give, I mean, they have a lot of forward versatility, but probably somebody that can play a couple of positions and get away with it. And if you don't have that, I'm not quite sure what the ceiling ends up being. And for me, 
it seems almost a little bit hypocritical that I would not really falter the Knicks for this bench as much as I usually do, because something I have been preaching until the cows come home, something I've been saying pretty much constantly, especially after this recent championship, made a whole main channel deep dive about it. Depth matters more than it ever has. The NBA's talent inflection and the fact that we are probably in need of expansion means that you are regularly seeing guys who are really good and would have played starters minutes years ago now being bench pieces. Dante DiVincenzo was about to be a victim of that exactly. However, when I say depth, depth doesn't just necessarily mean literally a number of bodies. It can also mean that you run like six deep, but those six are like real good. Like, it's a really good six. The thing I would compare that to is the Denver Nuggets. Uh, they won the championship in 2023, and after Bruce Brown, bench unit gets kind of ugly. Jeff Green was really the only other guy who played prominently, and the starters ended up eating up most of the minutes, which already happens in a playoff setting, but even to a higher degree than normal. The Celtics last year, Al Horford ended up starting a ton because of Porzingis missing time. So that means off of your bench, essentially your best bench player was fucking Sam Hauser. Sam Hauser, that's the guy's name. And Sam Hauser's a good bench piece, but Sam Hauser, Peyton Pritchard, like we're not talking about some star bench here, okay? This is a whatever bench. And then their starting lineup was about as good as it gets. Gets a little bit better when Al is coming off of the bench and Kristaps is there starting, but more often than not, the Knicks were the team with Al starting at the five, and they still won the fucking title. So the fact that the starting lineup is as solid as it is, if they can just get one more guy in there, which I believe they should have the assets to be able to do, maybe that's further draft capital because they moved a Pistons pick to get this done. One way or the other, I think they have what it takes to add one other guy here. And if we see a little bit of a leap from Miles McBride and we see this, whoever this guy may be added to the roster and end up being a contributor, Mitchell Robinson going to be one of the better backup centers in the NBA, the positional versatility of being able to play him alongside Carl Anthony Towns. I think that is enough for a postseason rotation. And if everybody's healthy, you can feel good about it worry about other things. Let's talk about these starters. And again, going to be repeating a couple of points here that I already did, but defensively speaking, I'm not too worried about this team. There are a lot of people who are worried about the prospect of Carl Anthony Towns being the man in the middle. However, I don't think it's going to be a huge issue. What I would compare this to is the Chicago Bulls when Lonzo and Alex Caruso were healthy. They were a top five, I believe even top three defense in the league. And that was despite the fact that Zach Levine, DeMar DeRozan, and Nikola Vucevic were your starters. Specifically Nikola Vucevic, who is not exactly known as the defensive anchor. But he's the five man. He was the man. He was the guy manning the middle, and they still had a good defense. You know why? Because their perimeter defense was comically good, terrifyingly good. Caruso and Lonzo is about as good of a defensive backcourt as you can possibly ask for. So the perimeter defense overall just made it so hard to do anything as a ball handler that you weren't getting easy opportunities at the rim anyways and then when you did get to the rim Nikola Vucevic was doing something that Carl Anthony Towns is well capable of which is just don't step too far out of the paint and get yourself caught on an island and be a big body just be a large man who is in between the player and the basket and I think asking Nikola Vucevic level defense is a reasonable ask. I think Carl Anthony Towns can get into that realm. I think he can achieve Nikola Vucevic level defense. So pr pr provided that happens with OG, Josh Hart, Mikhail Bridges, that is a remarkably good defensive core of forwards. To that degree, I think you end up being a good defense. Now, is it good that you have a center and a point guard that could be targeted? No, but I trust the upside of that. I think it will work as a whole. I think the defense will work as a whole. Will it be miles better than it was before? Probably not but it'll be good enough, more than good enough, still probably one of the top 10 defenses in the NBA. And then there are some major offensive improvements. Now I'm not gonna get too much into the dynamic of how this team works. I will just say having five out spacing for Jalen Brunson 
is going to make a world of difference. Jalen is one of those quote unquote shoebox guys, meaning like really good at scoring without having a lot of space, but all that really means is he should be even fucking better at scoring provided he gets even more space. So that's what I am anticipating here. That's what I expect. I'm expecting a career year from Jalen Brunson, an even better season than he had last year. Honestly, probably competes in the MVP race more than I originally gave credit in my video predicting the MVP award, but I don't have really any concerns for the offense at all. And I previously did. I used to have a lot of concern for the offense. There still is the factor that Carl Anthony Towns is inconsistent, but Jalen Brunson is able to shoulder the load enough and then uh, you need a McHale game, you need an OG game, whoever it may be. Like, McHale might not be best suited as a 20-point-per-game guy, but he is capable of getting 20 points on any given night on good efficiency, and that is a luxury that the Timberwolves did not have with Carl Anthony Towns. There wasn't really some other guy who could just get 20 on any given night. Like, maybe Nas Reed-ish, but that's about it. So I think even if you get some inconsistency from Cat, your offense is going to be fine because ultimately you're gonna have more spacing, Jalen Brunson is gonna be more effective, and that's going to prove to be a better offense. So I think the Knicks will be a way better offense than they were before, and a comparable, if not potentially better defense that maybe was going to be better regardless because of the addition of Mikhail Bridges. I'm not too concerned about the depth issue because at least they do run seven deep and their starting lineup is so fucking good and so solid that I think they can get away with something similar to what Denver did in 2023. Now what I want to talk about is their matchups in the Eastern Conference. There's really only three teams that they're going to have to be too fearful of, those being the Milwaukee Bucks, the Philadelphia 76ers, and obviously the Boston Celtics. We'll tackle how they can handle Boston soon, because I think what's really interesting is how well they match up with them. But let's talk about those lesser teams that a lot of people probably considered the Knicks to be better than to begin with. So with the Milwaukee Bucks, I am higher on them than a lot of people are because I think this is a case similar to, ironically, Minnesota when they got Carl Anthony Towns and Rudy Gobert together where it didn't work the first year, but it worked the second year. I think that's going to happen with the Bucks. I think Dame's going to be a lot better. I think Giannis, while his numbers will go down, will holistically be better, and Chris Middleton should be better. This should just be a better team than it was last year. That said, Giannis ain't nothing to fuck with. And if Damian Lillard's a better player, still an all-star caliber guy, he ain't nothing to fuck with either. I don't love the fact that Cat ends up being your rim protector with Giannis barreling to the basket. That is a situation where the being a Vucevic good enough rim protector doesn't really cut it. It does against most teams, it does against most players, but it doesn't really against Giannis. And you can say a similar thing for Joel Embiid in the Philadelphia 76ers matchup. So you might have to see more Mitchell Robinson in that situation. You might have to see more Cat at the four in that situation. But I think the perimeter defense should be good enough. Like what I would say is Dame probably has a rather bad series in that matchup, whether it's Josh, OG, or Mikhail who guards him. And then, like, OG is strong enough to handle a Giannis matchup initially and get help around the rim that's good enough to make him take an off-balance shot. Like, that's, that's how the wall system with the Toronto Raptors in 2019 ended up working, where it was actually Kawhi on the initial Giannis matchup, or sometimes it would be somebody else that actually wasn't OG because OG was injured for that playoff run, but I do I'm trying to remember who else it could, who it would be. Oh, Pascal Siakam, where it's like, yeah, these guys probably aren't as strong as Giannis, probably not as bothersome, but they have enough strength that they can, and defensive talent that they can disrupt his flow, make his life a little bit harder and get the offense or get his offense to not go smoothly and then if you're also shutting down Dame if you're also shutting down Chris Middleton at that point I think you've got it moving on to Philadelphia I think that is a little bit more of an ask because you have to defend across three positions who are the most prominent positions forward guard and center don't love cat on Joel Embiid 
But Mitchell Robinson, again, maybe he plays more minutes in that series. Maybe you do more cat at the four. And then in terms of Maxi and Paul George, Paul George is one of those guys where I don't think the defender you have on him actually does matter that much because he does so much off the ball work. It can matter in terms of how aware off ball defenders are. So that does matter. But most of his offenses, or at least a large percentage of it, is coming without a hand like right in his face anyways. So I don't know that he would struggle too much other than just playoff P typical struggles. Tyrese Maxey, I think, would probably struggle a little bit with the length of Mikhail. That's probably the matchup that I would give him. Again, you have the big man factor, which is concerning. I don't know how you handle Embiid. You could argue you let Embiid handle himself by just being the playoff dropper that he's historically been. Odds are he'll probably have some kind of injury going into that matchup, so you'll probably still be fine there. But ironically, the Bucks and Sixers being worse teams in Boston, I'm actually pretty much just as concerned for the Knicks in that matchup as I would be versus Boston. Now that's not because I think Philly or Milwaukee are actually on Boston's level, but rather that I think the, the Knicks just match up super, super well against this team. Center position, you've got another spacer. So this, the Celtics are not inherently getting that huge advantage of Porzingis' outside shooting that most teams cannot match. Then when you're talking about the most important scoring options on this team, well, you're talking about two forwards, and this is the best defensive forward core in the NBA, so you have the best possible matchup for that. Mikael Bridges would probably be who I put on Tatum, and OG would probably be who I put on Brown, but truly you can't go wrong with either of them. And then whether it's Derek White or Drew Holiday that's giving you more grief, you put Josh Hart on that guy. I don't think Jalen Brunson on one of those two ends up being too consequential because uh, more so Drew is a uh, becoming more and more of a spot-up guy. Derek White does a lot of attacking off of the dribble more so than Drew does at this point, which is not exactly what I would have guessed when that duo came together, but that's what it's been. So I'd probably put Jalen Brunson on Drew Holiday for that reason. But one way or the other, I think defensively they match up super well. Like Porzingis is not somebody who's really going to punish Carl Anthony Towns too much. He can be a decently fast roller here or there. Maybe he gets him on that every once in a while. But for the most part, I think Cat can defend Christos Porzingis just fine. He can do that job well enough. Then you have a great forward matchup. Then you have a pretty decent guard matchup. And then in terms of how Boston ends up defending New York, well... Porzingis is no longer going to be camping around the basket waiting for Brunson to get funneled into him. Like, Cat probably going to be standing in the corner on Brunson isolations, things like that. Porzingis is going to have to make a decision, and Boston has enough switchable defenders that they can make that work if they manage to bring a guy over to Cat before he gets an actual open look. But odds are you're not going to nail that rotation every time, and odds are the Knicks are going to find an opening more often than not with at least four guys on the floor who are very, very capable three-point shooters. So that's great offense, and I think Boston's defense, which is historically good, won't actually be nearly as bothersome to New York as it will to other teams because of that floor spacing factor. When you have a five-man that really isn't much of a three-point shooting threat, it closes up the floor a little bit. Now you can make up for that by having a lob threat at the center position, but Mitchell Robinson is not a great lob threat. Like he can do it, but it's not like he's just, it's not like he's going to do some Derek Lively or definitely not some DeAndre Jordan shit. As a whole, the spacing's improved so much that they're way harder to guard. It's way harder to load up on one individual because you can't just bring a help defender to bother Brunson every time he grabs the ball because you're going to be leaving open a capable shooter. Really the only guy in that starting lineup that I think defenses will truly test, like can you actually hit that shot, will be Josh Hart. Well, last year, Josh Hart was fucking great in the postseason shooting the three ball. I don't know if his percentage as a whole ends up being all that great. No, it's 37% on four and a half attempts. That's good. That's really 
really good, especially for someone who is potentially a little bit wishy-washy as a three-point shooter. So Josh Hart, probably not someone you want to really leave open either. That's who they would choose if they have to choose. But one way or the other, you are going to be giving the Knicks a lot of opportunities. And in terms of how the defense matches up against Boston, Boston's not going to get a lot of the easy opportunities that they typically do going against defenses that are just not really matched up well against what they like to do. I like New York a lot. I'm still picking Boston to win that series. I'm still picking Boston to win the East. However, provided health allows both parties to get there and the standings put them in this situation maybe it ends up being a second round matchup but one way or the other if boston and new york match up in the playoffs this year i don't think it's going to be an easy series for boston at all i'm not saying they'll lose i don't think they will but if they did it wouldn't necessarily shock me i'm also just factoring in that there hasn't been a repeat champion in forever and they're probably a little bit more tired than everybody else is going to be. I think it's very well possible. I think it's very well possible. And I have never fucking said this in my entire YouTube career. It is very possible that the New York Knicks could make the finals representing the Eastern Conference against a defending champion, no less, against a historically great, at least in terms of on-off numbers team, at that so yeah new york i'm very high on them i already liked the knicks a lot i'm really not that big of a fan of carl anthony towns to be honest he's one of the more frustrating players to watch in the nba but he's a type of frustrating that is more manageable than julius randall's brand of frustrating was and for that reason i think the ceiling on this team's offense has gone much higher and defensively while I th understand the concerns about Cat at the five, I think he's going to be fine given the rest of the personnel on that roster. Also, the concerns about the offensive consistency, again, personnel on the roster, kind of mitigates that damage. I like the Knicks. I like the Knicks a lot. I've made such a bit of hating on the Knicks for so many years. The truth is, I don't actually hate them. I do dislike a lot of their fan base because people from New York are just fucking obnoxious. A lot of them are proud of it. But I really liked this team last year. And I really only like them more because a lot of the things that would get in the way of me liking them, Julius Randle, is not one of them. That's no longer a factor here, so there's really not much to be upset about. And I don't get why so many Knicks fans are against this move. I've even seen a couple of people being like, yeah, Minnesota won this trade. I, I, I truly don't get where they're coming from there. Maybe I'll see it when the stuff actually hits the floor, but as of right now, it seems so clear to me that one of these teams got a big upgrade in the fit department, and one of them got a pretty significant downgrade with at least the consolation prize being Dante DiVincenzo is damn good. With that said, shout out to Nick for editing this video. He's back from his trip, so it's going to be him. And that's it. Goodbye.